Salsa Train 84 is a project that was created by Jason De Leon. He's an anthropologist and he has done research and in the desert, especially in the Sonoran Desert, on migration from the U.S.-Mexico border. He was looking at the effects of kind of nature and weather on bodies that are left in the desert. Specifically, House of Ray 94 is an exhibition that sort of displays 3,200 toe tags of migrants who have died trying to cross the U.S.-Mexico border. So we used Jason De Leon's book, uh, Line of Open Graves, and we had invited him to come speak, but instead he offered us this project to do. So Bronwyn, um, Maeve and I um, decided to try it out. We recruited some other students, um, including Kawatsan and Jimena, and the project started in January of 2020. Um, and basically the items came right before the pandemic hit. And when the pandemic hit, um, Jimena invented a way to make the tags um, digital. So half of the tags on here are handwritten, um, which are later tags in the project, and half of the tags are darker, um, and that signifies that they are digital. Prevention through insurance is a U.S. immigration policy that was put into place in 1994. This is inhumane and cruel and uh, not something that the United States should engage in. Prevention through deterrence policy by the United States is the intentional sort of gathering of um, immigration security at um, ports of entry, um, such as major cities on the U.S.-Mexico border, as a way of deterring um, illegal crossings at those ports of entry and instead funneling them into areas that are much more deadly to attempt to cross and experience. The idea is just to, is to try to use the border um, as a weapon against migration. You know, this policy has, has attempted to funnel you know, a lot of people through um, through this through this area. And if you go to Southern Arizona, I mean, this is what the border looks like. Um, this is near the port of entry called Zazabi. This is about two miles from the official kiosk where you would show a passport. Suddenly the fences drops off and now, you know, you can freely walk into the United States. These migrants are human and the things that they're going through are not human and especially in like conditions and what's making them run away from their home and coming so like just keeping that in mind like you know these people are really human and all they're doing is just trying to look for a better place for them and their family to live. I want people to know that they are human beings it's not just a statistic it's not just a number these are people who um, had potential for life uh, have families people they loved people who loved them and I think that's really at the core of uh, our project, making sure that we humanize the statistics that people are, that t people typically sort of gloss over um, when they talk and think about migrants um, at the border. During the process of migration, during the journey, they confront things from dehydration, um, extreme weather conditions, um, there is sexual violence, um, there are the coyotes, for example, there are the people that guide them through the desert, who are people that charge a lot of money, and it really depends on the coyote that takes people. Some of them are involved in larger schemes of violence um, that rob people or kidnap people or beat people up. There have been people dying from gunshot wounds. There have been people that have died, um, as I said, from dehydration, from hyperthermia, from hypothermia. Um, so there's just an array of like different um, forms of violence that people have encountered in the desert. And it is important to note that while there are extreme weather conditions, um, that is not a coincidence. People are going through those paths that are so dangerous because the government of the United States is like forcing them to go, like channeling migrants to go through them instead of the most urban spaces. This is Memo and Lucho. These are two men that I write about in my in my first book. Um, and of course, to do this, you know, you have to walk across a, a brutal landscape um, with extreme weather, especially during the summer, and having to deal with, um, you know, extreme forms of nature. So rugged terrain, um, venomous animals, folks are walking through, um, you know, across mountain ranges, because if you get up into the mountains, it's easier to avoid detection by the border patrol. Um, there's a whole host of, of sort of natural things here that are working against migrants, and especially the fact that people can only really carry two to four gallons of water, which is not enough to survive a multi-day trek.
people would be really taken aback by the fact that they had a tag for a 16 year old or someone who was from their age or perhaps someone who was even from their country of origin. And I think it's really easy to kind of get lost in all the politics and use that as an excuse to not see the name behind the face and the body. And so knowing that these people were real and just like us, and even then that it's an undercount of all of the tags on the wall. Like there are so many people who still aren't found. But also I think trying to remind people not to lose sight of the fact um, of why they died and the fact that death could have been prevented um, and could have been otherwise. There's a lot of different factors that, that sort of force people to flee their homes, but no one just packs up and leaves um, without good core reason. It is really, really hard for families to grieve or to begin the process of grieving without a body. Not being able to go to a grave and be assured that your loved one is there is something that keeps these families, you know, in this perpetual state of mourning. For the migrants and their families, I think the biggest part is to remember them and to honor their lives. And for a lot of people, this is the closest thing that they've had to a funeral or a proper burial or a proper goodbye to their bodies. I'm hoping that people who will see the wall will take some time to kind of examine their beliefs and maybe get involved, maybe not. I think for me, it was enough to know that, like I hadn't known about this before, perhaps someone else will now know and understand what's going on and use that to make some more informed decisions on their day-to-day -day, just kind of going around talking to people and being aware of what's happening in the world. You know, on one hand, and I think the really big one, is definitely like a call for change to legislation um, and changes to the legal aspects that make it so that people are forced to go to the desert. Um, and again, making it so that these preventable deaths are prevented um, and that people aren't, you know, forced through circumstances into these awful um, situations and terrains. And then I think on the other hand, the project also works. And I think kind of big, one of the big calls is like trying to constantly remind people like all over the world, um, especially considering like hostile terrain is something that has taken place like not only in the United States, but like a project that's taken on um, by different institutions around the world. Like again, with several of our events that we've had, um, you know, we've had people who said, this is something that's really near and dear to my heart. Thank you for doing this. Like, thank you for reminding people. And then there are other people who are like, I've never heard of this. I've never really is, like really realized that this is an issue. Um, and now this is something that I care about. The hope for the future is that we do not have to write out any more tags, that people will become students, community members, faculty, staff will become more civically engaged and know about this particular policy and help to stop it and to vote for representatives that um, are going to rewrite legislation um, for immigration policy um, so that prevention's returns is not does not continue to be our U.S. policy as it is right now.